like the way in which enslaved people were treated as property and luxury items. So another thing I want to talk about is Brooks Brothers location in New York City, which I think is important for unpacking its connection to slavery. As I mentioned, Brooks Brothers was located on the corner of Catherine and Cherry Street. It's a part of the city today that's sometimes referred to as Two Bridges because it's nestled between the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge. Of course, when Brooks Brothers was founded in 1818, neither of those bridges were there. But it was a, a bustling commercial, commercial and residential part of the city. And it also was in close proximity to the ports. It, um, and it was also in close proximity to um, slave ports. Of course, by the early 19th century in New York State, most people of African descent were either in the process of being freed or were born free. Um, but New York State, there's a reason they call it the Empire State. Like it's, it has connections globally and domestically. So even though slavery was in the process of, you know, ending in New York State when Brooks Brothers was founded, um, it certainly had connections to the American South and to other parts of the Western Hemisphere where slavery was still very much um, happening. Um, so enslavers, people who owned slaves, people who had connections to slavery were shopping at Brooks Brothers. And so many of the clothing that they manufactured ended up on the backs of enslaved people. This is just a screenshot of a Google map of New York in the 21st century. Um, and you can see the, the red marker is where Brooks Brothers was located. The second location, as you saw in the, the close-up of the label that I showed you was on the corner of Broadway and Grand Street, which would be present day Soho. The second, the third location was Union Square. So kind of in this part of the city. And then it moved a few blocks up to what I would refer to today as like the Flatiron District, 22nd and Broadway. And now the current flagship is um, in Midtown. So you can sort of track the development of Manhattan through sort of the way in which Brooks Brothers sort of gradually moved up the island of Manhattan. Um, when Brooks Brothers was at Union Square, one of its neighbors um, was Tiffany and Company. And so I wanna spend a few minutes talking about Tiffany and Company because it also has a connection to slavery that I think people um, don't really talk about. So of course, Tiffany and Company um, started off as a stationary company and fine goods store. Its first location was in um, Union Square in New York City. It was founded in 1837 by the 25-year-old Charles Lewis Tiffany. Um, and the startup capital um, came from his father, Comfort Tiffany. I love that name, Comfort. Um, it was a retailer of fine silver and other luxury goods, but it soon became famous for its watches, clocks, and fine jewelry. But it also is another example of the inexorable link between the production of raw goods in the South and Northern manufacturers and retailers. That's because Comfort Tiffany was part owner of several Connecticut cotton mills that processed cotton picked by enslaved people in the South. So without that startup capital, $1,000, um, which would be roughly $27,000 today, um, that money was generated in part from the unpaid labor of enslaved people. Uh, you know, $1,000 wasn't a lot then to start a, a business. It's certainly not a, not a lot of money now to start a business, but without it, without it we wouldn't have 
this company that's often more associated with like Tiffany Blue or Breakfast at Tiffany's. And as far as I know, there hasn't been any conversations about Tiffany and Company's connection to slavery. Even though it, unlike Brooks Brothers, the fact that the startup capital came from um, Comfort Tiffany is, is actually quite foundational to the founding of the company in a way that's not actually not true for Brooks Brothers. Brooks Brothers, you know, it had a livery department and some, some of that livery ended up on the backs of enslaved people. Um, but I wouldn't say that slavery was foundational to the company, and whereas Tiffany Company, it is. I included this document because this is actually where I started the research. There's a, a famous book written by Philip Foner, um, the late historian of slavery, and actually his son, Eric Foner, is also a historian of slavery, very important historian who's at Columbia. And in Business and Slavery, on the first page, um, there's a passing reference to Brooks Brothers' connection to slavery. And that's actually where I started um, this research. When I, I saw that footnote and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. You know, me being uh, a historian of slavery, in particular, um, historian of enslaved people's dress. Um, it's something that I wanted to unpack further, further but I was like, I can't, like this one footnote is not enough um, for a chapter. But then once I um, found out that the Historic New Orleans collection had two Brooks Brothers coats that was worn by enslaved people, that for me was enough to like really like launch this research. So this document was really my jumping off point because um, this is the footnote in Philip Foner's Business and Slavery. And if you look at number 29 on the list, you can see Brooks Brothers is number 29. This is a, 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 a letter that was published in New York World. And the businesses that are listed at, towards the bottom of the letter were complaining that Southern work employers, um, Southern work employers, air quotes here, um, weren't paying their bills on time. Of course, Southern work employers is a euphemism for enslavers. Um, so they were essentially complaining that um, plantation owners and slavers weren't paying their bills. And a, a number of companies and firms signed on to this letter. In number 29, you can see Brooks Brothers. Most of these companies and firms no, no longer exist. I've done a lot of research on all these companies. Um, the only companies that still exist, there's, a, there's a, one of these, and I can't find it right now, but late long company is a, still a financial firm that exists. And also Brown Brothers, um, of course, still exists. And also, it's a financial institution. There's actually been a lot of research on Brown Brothers connection to slavery. Several books have been written about that. Another one of these companies that still exists, well, existed until very recently is Rogers and Company. Rogers and Company, um, um, was a precursor to Rogers Pete, which is a, a menswear label that existed for over a century. I think it folded in the 1980s. Um, but other than those three, um, none of these companies exist anymore as far as I know. So I'm starting to wind down a little bit, but I, I wanna talk a little bit about sort of the modern history of Brooks Brothers. Um, Brooks Brothers Archive is managed by the History Factory, which is a corporate archive management firm. And I've had trouble um, getting access to Brooks Brothers Archive. This research I, I've done through, through other sources, other means like the Historic New Orleans Collection or you know, through William Newton Mercer's archive papers at LSU, but I actually haven't gotten access to Brooks Brothers Archive. That's because the History Factory is very protective of the archive, they vet who has access um, to the archive because Brooks Brothers still exists. <laughs> it's still a company. It's not doing very well. In fact, it actually went bankrupt um, in 2020. Um, but what Brooks Brothers sells is his heritage. And so they don't want anyone sort of digging around the archive, unearthing 
anything that could sort of sully Brooks Brothers heritage. And so I actually, unfortunately, haven't gotten any ac access to Brooks Brothers archive. Um, but um, this is a screenshot of a recent report by the History Factory. Um, and as you can see, um, the title of the, the report is Perils of the Past. And this, this is the image that was at the very top of the report. Um, as you can see on the right, it's um, women advocating for equal pay to close the, the wage gap. On the left, you can see polluting smokestacks. And in the very center, you see a 19th century line drawing of a slave ship. And so what's visually being communicated um, in this report is that if you have a problematic history, whether it's unfair labor practices, not paying women properly, or history of pollution, or a connection to slavery, the history factory will help you sort of sweep this history under the rug. As the, as the tagline says, what companies should know about their histories and how to manage them. Um, so I'm really interested in um, the idea of a heritage brand and, and how old brands, whether it's the History Factory or Chanel, which has a very problematic history or any other number of like sort of heritage brands, how do they manage um, these problematic histories? Okay, this is the second to last slide. Um, Brooks Brothers is fully embedded in American history, which includes the most American of institutions, slavery. The success and longevity of Brooks Brothers is due in part to its connection to slavery and the profits it gained from selling clothing to planters in the South. By counting slaveholders among its clientele, Brooks Brothers directly benefited from the buying and selling of enslaved men, women, and children. And um, this last slide is just my socials. Um, as I've started off saying, I'm, I'm very active on social media. I often share my research findings on Instagram and Facebook, and also tweet, and I'm on YouTube too. So feel free to follow your follow me on your social media platform of choice. And um, I'm gonna stop sharing soon, but I would love to get any questions our comments, our critiques of this research. Thank you so much for listening to, listening to me drone on for um, you know 40 minutes plus. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Square. It was a fantastic presentation. We are going to start the Q&A. Um, we have a couple of questions up in the Q&A uh, section of the Zoom app. Um, we've also pulled a few from uh, the chat and Tess and I also have some of our own. So uh, we will get started first with the Q&A section. And if anyone has any questions, you can post them on that Q&A section and they'll pop up for me um, to pass on to Dr. Square. So the first question from uh, Rosabel Guzman uh, was um, Brooks Brothers made uniforms? Yes, they did. Um, and I think another person could, you know, have that as a research topic. Yeah, they manufactured uniforms. And famously, Brooks Brothers manufactured uniforms for um, a New York regiment. And at the time, there was a shortage of proper materials for these uniforms. So that the uniforms, they, they used shoddy, which is um, like a mealy textile to like supplement um, the wool for the uniforms. And so the uniforms were actually badly made. Um, so yeah, in any case, that, that that's a whole nother history. But yeah, um, Brooks Brothers made clothing for um, um, soldiers, um, sailors, um, you know, when we think about Brooks Brothers, we often, Brooks Brothers gentrified itself in the early 20th, 20th century. So now we associate it with like, you know, preppy, all American, collegiate fashion. But in the 19th century, um, it was sort of a just go to menswear emporium. So if you were an elite white man in New York City, 
you can go there and get a custom suit. But it also made sort of ready-made garments for, you know, domestics, whether they're free and enslaved, sailors, soldiers. Um, I, I kind of think of Brooks Brothers as being like the men's warehouse of the 19th century. Because today, if you go to men's warehouse and you want to spend like $5,000, you can. You can also go to men's warehouse and, and spend like $100. And that's what Brooks Brothers was in the 19th century. It wasn't until like the early 20th century after it had been around for hundred years and they started reflecting on like their place in American history. And so they started to think of themselves as being sort of a hoity-toity brand of the elite, but that wasn't true in the 19th century. So yes, to answer your question, because <laughs> then kind of we're going on a tangent. They did manufacture uniforms, particularly in the late 19th century, well into like the beginning of the 20th century. Excellent. Um, another question from Regine Richter McLean. You kind of addressed this already, but maybe you can elaborate a little more. Um, did you ask and or receive support from the Brooks Brothers when doing your research, such as given access to the company's own historic documents? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I wish. Um, you know, I wish Brooks Brothers would give me access to the archive, but unfortunately, and it actually is not Brooks Brothers, it's the History Factory. It's the History Factory manages their archive and they're very protective of that relationship that they have with Brooks Brothers because actually when Brooks, when the History Factory was founded in the late 1970s, um, the founder reached out to Brooks Brothers because he was a Brooks Brothers enthusiast. Um, he went to Harvard, he probably was a Brooks Brothers customer himself. And so, one of his first clients was Brooks Brothers. And so the success of the History Factory is actually tied up in the fact that one of its first clients was Brooks Brothers. So, so they're very protective of that relationship. And for that reason, they don't want some um, enterprising young scholars to like dig up more information about their connection to slavery. So unfortunately, I haven't had access to the archive. Um, I've been able to sort of use other institutions and universities um, to like do this research, but I would love to at some point um, and I also think it's not smart for Brooks Brothers. You know, it's, it's 2022. We're at a moment where we're sort of cr cr critically reevaluating um, institutions and, and connections to slavery. And I think the smart thing to do would be for them to sort of get in front of the narrative and control the narrative. Um, and, you know, I think there's a, a number of ways that they could do it. They could sort of address it head on and sort of set up a, a scholarship fund to welcome people of color into the fashion industry and like set up a mentorship program or like a, a pipeline program for positions within the company. Um, unfortunately, I feel like what Brooks Brothers has sold is sort of tradition and a connection to the establishment. And so they wanna sort of protect that image unfortunately. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have someone in the chat who um, mentioned that they actually worked at Brooks Brothers for 25 years and they have some files that they would be happy to share with you. Oh, <laughs> So maybe okay. we can be connected <laughs> after, um, after the uh, presentation is over. Please. Yeah. Um, so the next question in our Q&A is from Tanya McCoy. Does the gentleman club you referenced have members or colors? Members or colors? Oh, members of color. Oh, sorry, that's, yes. It says members or, but I think they mean of color. Oh, maybe members Ooh. or colors. <laughs> <laughs> As, assuming that whoever wrote that um, meant members of color. You know, I don't know much about the Boston Club. There's a lot of secrecy around it because it's it's a private um, men's club. There used to be a lot of these clubs earlier in the 20th century. There, there were a lot of them in, in New York City and in, in Boston as well, just like private clubs for men. Women were excluded from these clubs and there are only a handful that still exist today because, you know, it's 2022. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, so to answer um, um, Tanya's question, I imagine if there are any members of color, 
Um, they're probably only a handful. Um, this is a club that's for elite white men. This is, you know, this is New Orleans and we all know about New Orleans. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have another question. Have you uncovered any instances of Africans and people of color engaging Brooks Brothers as a customer? Um, they're curious about Brooks Brothers customer base over time. Great question. Thank you for the question, whoever wrote that. Yes, absolutely. And actually, this is part of a larger book project. And I end the chapter talking about W.E.B. Du Bois, because W.E.B. Du Bois was actually a custom, uh, Brooks Brothers customer. I've gone through his papers and I've found several Brooks Brothers receipts. And, you know, when you think about W.E.B. Du Bois, he was always dressed very smartly, very dapperly. And so he, he was a, a Brooks Brothers customer. And it, the reason why that's particularly interesting is because I found one letter in which he talks about going into a Brooks Brothers location to be outfitted. And so this man who, who was famously <laughs> black, like he wore his blackness on his sleeve, uh, he was a race man, walked into the Madison Avenue Brooks Brothers and was fitted for a suit. Um, so yeah, black people have, have long been customers of Brooks Brothers. Um, that's why it's, it's a shame that Brooks Brothers is, is so, like wary of like, cause there's a way that they could like really sort of lean into that history. Um, it's, it's not just like big bad Brooks Brothers, the, the you know, that had enslavers as customers. Like it, it also has a history that's, 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 they can actually be promoting as well. Also a lot of famous jazz players were Brooks Brothers customers. Miles Davis shot their Brooks Brothers. Um, Louis Armstrong shot their Brooks Brothers. Wynton Marsalis, I mean, thinking about New Orleans, is a, is a Brooks Brothers customer. Um, so there are a lot of like prominent African Americans who shop and have shopped at Brooks Brothers. Very interesting. Um, so the next question: uh, Where was Brooks Brothers manufactured? Factoring centered in the nineteenth century. It was um, in New York City, like in Manhattan, like there. Um, like the factory was above the retail space. Um, that That's not true for the Catherine and Cherry Street location, but when it moved to Grand and Broadway, it was a building of several floors. And so the retail space was on the ground floor and the upper floors were manufacturing spaces. Not 100% of its manufacturing was there, but the majority of it was there. Fine. Um, so another question, would Brooks Brothers have gotten raw cotton directly from the cotton growing states? I get this question a lot. It's not something that I've studied, like the, the, the materiality of their products. Um, the coats that are the focus of um, the talk today, or it's the, the outer layer is wool and the inner layer is silk. Um, but Brooks Brothers certainly had cotton products. And I'm not entirely sure where they sourced the cotton from. It most likely came from the American South because the US was the, the major global producer of cotton at that time. And you know, the US is still a major producer of cotton globally. So most likely the cotton that they were using came from the American South. But it's not something that I've uh, that I've studied. And th th those are the kind of documents that you would see in Brooks Brothers archive which I don't have access to. <laughs> right, of course. Um, did Brooks Brothers have enslaved or formerly enslaved people working for them? Ooh, good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know. In the 19th century, um, most of their employees were um, white people who lived in New York City. Um, some of them were recent immigrants. Some of them um, might have been Jewish. Um, I don't know how many, and so very recently, uh, I don't know how many people of color or Black people were employed by Brooks Brothers. Today, I know that there's, there's several Black employees of Brooks Brothers, but if we're talking about the, the 19th century or even the early 20th century, I have no idea. Um, I imagine if there were, enslaved people or formerly enslaved people who were employed by Brooks Brothers, it was only a handful. 
Mm -hmm. And it probably wasn't a, a front facing position. Yeah, I would imagine not. Uh, so we have another question. I'm just going to paraphrase. Um, the question is regarding sort of how do we navigate our relationship to Brooks Brothers moving forward? How do you feel maybe about their clothing, wearing their clothing, buying their clothing? Yeah, I get this question a lot. Like sometimes, um, particularly from when men hear my research, they're like, so am I supposed to like throw away all my Brooks Brothers? And my, my, my answer would be, no, one, it's wasteful. I'm actually wearing Brooks Brothers tonight. <laughs> this is, a, uh, I bought this second hand, no, I didn't buy it from Brooks Brothers. The, the, the money went to, <laughs> to Goodwill, not to Brooks Brothers. Um, but this is a Brooks Brothers pajama top that I'm wearing. Okay. Uh, I, wear, I, I wear pajama tops during the day. <laughs> um, but no, like, I mean, I'm not necessarily saying that you should like go spend money at Brooks Brothers. Um, there's there's other companies that I think um, that are that I would tell you to support other other than Brooks Brothers, but don't necessarily like throw away our, all the Brooks Brothers in your closet. Um, and also, it's like you know, I don't know if the solution is to like stop shopping at Brooks Brothers altogether. I think the solution is to ask, ask them to be accountable for their history. And I think, you know, I really what I really wish Brooks Brothers would do is um, sort of let go of its history, address its history, and then let go of the history. Um, because I think, you know, fashion evolves and, and the way people are dressing is evolving. And, and the reason why Brooks Brothers is not doing well is that people dress differently. You know, at the height of Brooks Brothers' success, you know, most professional men woke up every morning and they put on a suit. So you, you needed a closet full of suits. Um, people don't dress like that anymore. Suits are for a special occasion if you wear a suit at all. And so Brooks Brothers need to evolve. They need to sort of change the kind of products that it has. Um, I would love for them to like partner with a, a tennis shoe company and like create a tennis shoe that you can wear with you know, suiting, or I would love for them to even have like a really sort of splashy, younger designer, sort of like really sort of disrespect the brand codes, which I think is important for evolution. Like you, you sort of have to make fun of yourself and like really sort of, but I think Brooks Brothers is not, is not willing to sort of let go of itself. So there's sort of an ossification that's happened. There's, 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 there's a lack of like um, sort of, like just looseness or fun. Um, I would love for them to like, like I, I'm a big fan of the designer, Jerry Lorenzo, um, who has the, uh, the brand Fear of God. I'm a big fan of Tremaine Emery, who has the brand Denim Tears. I would even love to see them like have Kanye be a creative director. <laughs> I just think they need to like um, let go of themselves a little bit and just like address the history, but also let go of the history and sort of like, you know, be a, a, a brand that people sort of like have fun with. Absolutely, yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense, um, you know, particularly because there really are few things that aren't connected to that history we can't toss out, like all of popular culture. Uh, we have to rework it, just like we need to rework our clothes. Exactly. I mean, I taught at Harvard for like three and a half years. Like Harvard is a slave university. Like all that Harvard money, with Harvard is, is the, one of the wealthiest universities in the world. All of that wealth came, well, not all of it, sorry. Um, that's an overstatement. Uh, a significant chunk of that wealth came from connections to slavery and the slave trade. And I taught there for three and a half years. It's like, if, you, if we sort of do away with any connection to slavery, then we need to like, pack up the entire country <laughs> and move somewhere else because slavery and like also like the slaughter and the displacement of native peoples is foundational to this country so i'm not asking you to stop shopping at brooks brothers i'm not asking you to throw your auto brooks brothers in your company i'm just asking you to like look at this history yeah that makes tons of sense uh so next question what was an unexpected finding in your research 
unexpected finding. Um, I guess I would repeat um, my response to the, the, um, the other person. I didn't realize that, that Miles Davis was a Brooks Brothers company, was a Brooks Brothers customer. I didn't realize Louis, Louis Armstrong was a Brooks Brothers customer. Um, Whitney Marsalis was also a surprise to me. And just how, how many Black people are able to take this thing, this company, um, that's often associated with whiteness, with, you know, the elite, um, and sort of make it their own, to put their own spin on it. And that was a really surprising history. And I guess I'm doing it right now. I'm, I'm wearing Brooks Brothers <laughs> um, as we speak. So um, yeah, I would say that that would be the biggest surprise for me. Great. Um, so we have another one with sort of two questions in it. Um, one is about the um, presidential list. They said they think that Hayes had an asterisk next to his name and they wanted to know why. I think it was Clover Cleveland who had the asterisk. And the reason, and this is a very simple answer, but he served twice as American president, but it wasn't consecutive. So it was two different American presidencies mm. um, that weren't consecutive. So that's why I put an asterisk next to it. So he's not counted twice on the list, in other right. words. Uh, and the other question is, um, do you have any idea how much uh, the livery amounted to for Brooks Brothers income early on and what materials were used on it that were not found on its other clothing lines? Great question. Um, I've only seen a handful of Brooks Brothers livery, so I haven't seen enough to actually answer that question. That's, again, that's the kind of document or the kind of information that would be available by having access to Brooks Brothers archive. So I don't really know. I actually don't know to what extent um, the revenues from the livery department sort of accounted for its overall profits. Um, the fact that by the mid, no, by the early 20th century, there wasn't a livery department anymore tells me that it wasn't sort of central. Um, but it certainly was a, um, a key component um, in the 19th century, because in the 19th century, Brooks Brothers um, merchandise was more varied. Like I said, it had a livery department, it, it made clothing for soldiers and sailors, it also made custom suiting for elite men. Um, by the 20th century, it, it's, it's just sort of like a, a suiting apparel company for wealthy men. Um, so I, I imagine in, in the 19th century, the livery department was making more money for the, the company, but like like I said, once it starts to gentrify itself, um, it's sort of to do away with the fact that it made uniforms, whether it's for soldiers or for domestics. Uh, so several people have asked uh, if you could repeat the name of your book and let us know when it is coming out. Oh, um, so the title of the book, tentative title. <laughs> is Negro Cloth, How they Rebirth the American Fashion System. Um, I don't know when it's coming out because I'm in the middle of um, writing it. <laughs> but fingers crossed, hopefully it'll be out in two to three years. So, uh, you know, as soon as it's, as soon as I finish it and, you know, I have a cover and a publisher, then I'll, of course I'll share it on all my platforms. Excellent. I, I typed the title in the chat. I hope I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> you were uh, saying. Um, okay, so next question. Knowing the prominent African-Americans who were Brooks Brothers customers, do you think they would have reconsidered their purchases if they were aware of Brooks Brothers connection to enslavement? W.E.B. Dubois in particular, um, they asked because it seems that by ignoring their past history, Brooks Brothers is concerned about sales. And I would, I would maybe add to that myself. Um, on the flip side, do you think that there might have been an awareness and a little bit of like um, sort of an intentional pushback in wearing that clothing? Oh, interesting. Um, in all honesty, I think most of the individuals that I named 
weren't aware of this history because most people in general aren't aware of this history. Um, and I think what, if, if they were aware, would they continue shopping at Brooks Brothers? Um, that's a good question. I imagine some, some of them would be wary of shopping there knowing of this history. But of course, we all know of brands now that have a problematic history or like have problematic labor practices and people still shop there. Um, in fact, I would hazard to say that majority of the clothes we wear, if we dig deep enough, probably has some connection to um, coerced labor or if not coerced labor, then um, poorly paid labor. And we, we continue to shop at all the places <laughs> that have those problematic histories, knowing that history, um, it's, it's, it's just the, the, the nature of capitalism. It's hard to sort of extricate yourself from the system. Um, so um, I imagine some of them um, would probably be wary, wary of shopping at Brooks Brothers, but I imagine some would probably um, would have a justific justification for continuing to shop there. Um, whether it's sort of an inter like an intervention saying that, you know, I changed the meaning of this garment by putting it on my black body. Um, my, me wearing this is an act of resistance. So I can imagine someone saying that as well. Yeah. Um, someone asks uh, if you've encountered any descendants of Brooks Brothers, of the original founders, I guess, in your research. I have actually, it's not something that I've believed done any great research on. Um, it's more so people reaching out to me saying that, that they're our descendant of um, Henry Sands Brooks. So Brooks Brothers was founded by a man named Henry Sands Brooks. And when he passed away, he left the store to his sons. And that's where Brooks Brothers, like there were four Brooks Brothers, and that's where the name comes from. And so I've met well, I've people who are descendants of Henry Sands Brooks have reached out to me. Um, and actually they were black um, because, uh, and I haven't, this is unverified. I haven't done any genealogical work, but someone reached out to me who was black and said that they were descendants of St. Henry Sands Brooks. Um, none of the white descendants have necessarily reached out to me, um, but yeah. A black descendant of Henry Sands Brooks has reached out to me, and I haven't done any sort of genealogical research to like verify if they're actually um, descend descended from him or not. Yeah, very interesting. Um, opens some possibilities, maybe for future directions, for sure. I'm gonna uh, throw in a few questions from the chat, um, and then I'll come back to the Q and A in a bit. Um, so we had someone asking, "What are your thoughts?" on the recent Ralph Lauren partnership with HBCUs. Oh my gosh, that's that's a can of worms there. Oof, <laughs> where do I start? You know, I've thought a lot about the, the, this collection um, just because I have a critique, but my critique has to be nuanced because I think there's a lot that they've actually done right. Um, you know, the, this collection was spearheaded by Black employees of Ralph Lauren, who are graduates of Spelman in Morehouse. Um, so I think there's a lot that they've actually done right. That's why I say my critique has to be really nuanced. Um, I guess my two critiques would be, and this is, this is really nitpicky. <laughs> um, because there's a lot that I like about the collection actually, but sustainability, um, there's no conversations about sustainability, which I think moving forward, any fashion maker has to consider sustainability. So it's just, it's just regular sweatshop clothes that they make, they're making. It's just branded with Morehouse and Spelman. So that would be one critique. Um, I've also, um, Another critique would be that it's very binary. Again, we're in the middle of a gender renaissance and sort of we're in the process of doing away with gender and the collection is very menswear, women's wear. Again, let me repeat that I'm being very nitpicky. There's a lot that I like about 
the collection and there's a lot that they've done right. Um, so that would be my two critiques. Great, yeah, that was very interesting. Um, someone else had been asking about a slide that you had that had an X and an O on it. Uh, and I happen to be looking away at this particular moment, so I don't remember it myself either. If you could just elaborate on what that was about, explain a little further. Yeah, they're referring to the, the inventory of um, formerly enslaved people um, that, that's part of William Newt Mercer's papers. And so the X's and O's on, on that slide, that document, um, represents individuals who ran away or attempted to run away. Mm -hmm. um, during this period in 1865, of course, all those individuals were technically free. So many of them left the plantation. That was an attempt to like maintain order to keep people laboring on the plantation, even though they were free. Because we, we all know that emancipation was a gradual process, even after the Emancipation Proclamation, which is why Juneteenth is such an important holiday. Um, so the X's and O's represents people who either ran away or attempted to run away. Uh, so I have a question of my own for you. Um, it seems like in the broader narrative of fashion history, there's this claim that like ready-made didn't really start till the 20th century, likewise about secondhand not starting till the 20th century. And that's clearly not true based on what your research reveals. So I'm curious if you could just elaborate a little bit more about that narrative, if that's something that you've encountered and that you're like trying to counter and, and how through this research. Thank you for the comment. That's great. That's actually something I talk a lot about in the chapter, like the, the, the idea of ready-made clothing, because you're absolutely right. It's often like, oh, everyone was hand sewing their clothing in the 19th century. <laughs> and that wasn't true. There was a, there was a ready-made industry um, in the 19th century. And it was particularly for laborers, whether they were free or enslaved, or soldiers, or sailors. Um, and Brooks Brothers was, was one of those companies that made ready-made garments for, for laborers. Um, you know, scholars often refer to Brooks Brothers as being a slop shop, which is a term for um, cheap ready-made garments for men. I wouldn't go as far as to say that, because even by the mid 19th century, Brooks Brothers was starting to be associated with the elite. It had already outfitted a number of American presidents and, and very prominent individuals. And that's why Brooks Brothers was sacked during the 1865 draft riots, because of its association with the elite. So it wasn't quite a slop shop, but like I said, it was like the men's warehouse of the 19th century. So it could serve the most elite of clients, but it also made clothing for domestics, whether free or enslaved, or sailors and soldiers. Um, but yeah, there was a number of like clothing firms in New York City throughout the 19th century that made ready-made garments. Um, and Brooks Brothers was one of them. And it often, if you read like promotional material for Brooks Brothers, it often tells the fact that like we were one of the first companies to make ready-made garments patting themselves on the back. What they, what they don't say is that these ready-made garments were one, sometimes shoddily made, and two, often ended up on the backs of enslaved people. Yeah, no, and it seems like maybe the, the more accurate narrative is that ready-made wasn't considered acceptable or glamorous by some people, most people, until the 20th century. Probably right. precisely those connections. And the reason that these garments were ready-made is because enslaved people weren't being outfitted for custom clothing. Soldiers weren't given custom clothing. They, they had to take what was given to them. They didn't get bespoke coats. <laughs> Shocker. Um, <laughs> uh, so another question that Tessa uh, sent on to me, so this is from Tessa herself. Um, she's curious if there are other comparable brands that were known for outfitting presidents. And I would also add maybe for outfitting enslaved people, are there like similar kind of figures? How unique is Brooks Brothers, I guess? This is Tessa Malfucci. Hi, Tessa. I think I might know Tessa. Oh, no, no this is Tessa. Our Tessa. Oh, 
Okay, <laughs> never mind. I have a friend named Tessa. Um, I thought it might have been her, but you're Tessa, sorry. Hi, Tessa, anyway. <laughs> um, yes, um, Brooks Brothers is unique. Um, I can't think of another brand that has the same connection to the American presidency as Brooks Brothers. Um, if I had to give you a second, it would be Ralph Lauren, which is another great American brand. I'm using air quotes here. I'm not trying to reify that narrative. Um, mm -hmm. Great American brand. Um, so Brooks Brothers is really unique in that respect, of course, because Ra Ralph Lauren is, is, is relatively a young brand. I mean, Ralph Lauren is still alive. Um, it was founded, I think, in the late 60s or early 70s. Um, so yeah, I would say Brooks Brothers is, is unique. And it, to answer the second part of that question, are there any brands that can we can associate with enslavement or enslaved people? No. Um, again, Brooks Brothers is unique um, in that respect. It's 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 the last surviving brand. It's the oldest American brand for one. Just full stop. Um, there's no American clothing company that's older than Brooks Brothers. Um, all other brands are companies that make clothing for enslaved people, as far as I know, don't exist. One exception, people often say Levi's, but Levi's, as far as I know, has no connection to slavery. It has connections to like workers and laborers, but, but not necessarily to enslaved people. Denim does, but not Levi's, the company. Um, Lord and Taylor, I'd be, I, I'd love for a scholar to like really dig into those Lauren Taylor papers, which are actually archived at FIT. Are there any like PhD students, grad students who are looking for a project, like look into those Lauren Taylor papers. I say that because Lauren Taylor, Taylor was founded a few years after Brooks Brothers in the early 19th century. And actually Lauren Taylor was like Brooks Brothers neighbor in lower Manhattan. So I imagine um, people who were shopping at Brooks Brothers we're also shopping at Lord and Taylor. And so I think there might be a connection there, but I haven't done that research yet. Um, and I don't, I don't know if I will, um, but there might be something there. Yeah. Um, if, I, if we broaden uh, the question a little bit, just to think about like current clothing companies that have a problematic history, not necessarily the slavery, but just, just something questionable or problematic. I would add Chanel, of course, and we all know that Coco Chanel was uh, not only a Nazi sympathizer, she took it a step further. Like she actually had a relationship with a, a Nazi officer and actually um, was quite anti-Semitic, so. Yeah, I've heard a few histories of companies that had their origins in Germany at that time and were involved in making uniforms and things. There's a lot of that in the fashion world as well. Hmm. Um, well, we have hit 7.30. So unfortunately, uh, that concludes our Q&A. Um, but I want to thank you so much. Let's give another round of virtual applause to Dr. Jonathan Michael Square. Um, on behalf of the Herman Grimma and Gallier Historic Houses, I would like to thank Dr. Square for speaking with us this evening. For information on the upcoming lectures in the Gallier Gathering series, including next month's lecture titled Anne Rice's World Building Through Archives and Architecture with Nix Mendy, Processing Associate from Tulane University Special Collections, and Mara Lepere Schloop, Production Designer for the AMC Interview with the Vampire Television Series, please visit our website www.hggh.org for more information and to register. And I would like to once again, thank you for your continued support of our museum. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Gallier gatherings. And thank you again, Dr. Square. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.